All right, it's 6.31. So I'm just gonna give a couple minutes. All right, I see that we are live. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in um, to our Ask the Expert series today. Um, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes just to let some people in. Um, yeah. All right, so I think we shall begin. Um, so I'm gonna start by introducing myself. Hi everyone, my name is Melisha Pascarathas. My pronouns are she and they, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's Ask the Expert series. Um, today we we'll be focusing on talking about cannabis education, in the, particularly in the context um, for youth. And I'll first um, start by introducing myself and um, where we stand. So I'd first like to acknowledge that we are on traditional territories of indigenous lands um, known as uh, Canada, also known as Turtle Island. And I would like to take the time um, for each person respectively, to, just to take some time to reflect on the lands that they are occupying, that they are settling right now, um, just to reflect on, you know, what this land provides for us. And, you know, we are on traditional territories and there are resources that you can look to see which traditional territories you are on. And I will also have a link uh, sent shortly in the chat just to show you about um, more resources and information about traditional territories and information that you'd like to know just to educate yourself. And I'd first like to acknowledge that I reside uh, currently in Brampton, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the territories of the Mississauga Credit. Um, and I would like to kind of pass on uh, the mic to each of our panelists and uh, please introduce yourself, um, your pronouns, where you're located, and a little bit about your organization um, and what you're looking forward to. So I'm going to pass on to Emma. Sure thing. Um, so I'm Emma. Um, I use she, they pronouns. Um, I'm currently in um, what is now known as Montreal, um, was Jojage. Um, the traditional unceded territory of the Ganekihaga. Um, a little bit more about um, the organization that I'm here representing. Um, I work for VoxCan, which is a uh, Montreal-based um, bilingual cannabis education initiative. Our whole thing is um, building cannabis education from the ground up. So to do that, we use a by youth and for youth approach, pretty much trying to make sure that youth's voices are actually heard and respected and integrated into the cannabis um, education that they receive. Um, I'm currently the director of research with VoxCan um, and I've been working in that capacity for about three years at this point, um, doing workshops pretty much with anything from high schools to SAGEPs to adult ed centers pretty much just talking with youth as well as educators um, just to try to build better cannabis education for, for young people. Yeah. Uh, Heath, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sweet. Uh, my name is Heath. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm jo joining from Jojage as well. Um, and I am the project facilitator for Get Sensible, which is a campaign led by Canadian students for sensible drug policy, um, funded by the Substance Use and Addictions Program. Um, it's an entirely youth-led initiative. Um, so everyone on the team is 30 or under. Uh, we really emphasize harm reduction in a lot of the uh, education work that we do. 
um, as well as kind of taking an intersectional approach to cannabis education that doesn't just fixate on like the health effects, but looks at cannabis more broadly, um, looks at like social and political considerations for drug use, um, addressing things like uh, stigma as well is something that comes up a lot in our conversations with youth. Uh, we have a resource on our website that was entirely uh, written and designed by young people. It's a really nice um, resource. The, the redesign will be coming out soon. It's not available yet unless you come to one of our events. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we do like community organizing stuff with young people um, to facilitate youth-led dialogues about cannabis that emphasize like uh, knowledge mobilization and like dissemination from an evidence-based lens, but also prioritize like um, lived experience and like listening to young people um, and like mobilizing education through narrative storytelling as well, I guess. That's a little bit about us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Sylvia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Sylvia, and I use the pronoun she, her. Um, the area that I'm located in is called Nogo Juwang. It's an Anishinaabe word meaning place at the end of the rapids. And it's the tra traditional territories of the Mississauga Nation, which is comprised of four communities who are within that, the Mississaugas of Curve Lake, of Hiawatha, of Aldervale, and the Mississaugas of Scugog. Um, it's also on Treaty 20, which overlaps with the William Treaties. As far as um, my work is concerned, I am the project coordinator uh, for Springboard, and it's a project that I'm working on called Weed Out the Risk. It's existed since 2014, but for the last um, few years, as since legalization in 2018, we've gone national in scope, educating youth with a harm reduction approach on the risks of cannabis impaired driving or the risks of getting into the car with a cannabis impaired driver. Um, yeah. And we're, we're partnered with Mad Canada, so we also have, um, we're responsible for uh, training their staff to deliver the program uh, full time in schools. Thank you. And um, I'll start off by introducing uh, Cannabis and Psychosis. Um, so I forgot to mention, I am a Youth Action Committee member from Cannabis and Psychosis. And a little bit about us is we are a national project um, under the Schizophrenic Society of Canada, funded by Health Canada. And um, our primary goal is to aim, um, in, educate and increase awareness about the connection between cannabis and psychosis um, through a lens of youth, as we have many people in our team who have lived experiences, who come from different backgrounds. Um, and our main motto is essentially by youth for youth. And right now we are working on uh, creating an educational course um, relating to cannabis and mental health. And so um, that's perfect because we're going to segue into talking about why we're all gathering here today and um, why we what we're going to be discussing about, which is uh, cannabis education, um, especially amongst youth. And we're going to highlight um, as we have a, a variety of um, experts here with us right now, we're going to kind of have an in-depth conversation about the importance of effective cannabis education, the nuances of that, and why it's important, especially after legalization. And, you know, it's been three years um, since legalization and what that means in the educational sector for youth and for mm -hmm. our allies for of youth. And um, I'd also like to, um, before we I begin asking the questions to our panelists. Um, just like to let the audience know, you can feel free to ask your questions in the comments below, um, and we'll try our best to um, answer those questions in a timely manner as we see them come up. Um, all right, so we're gonna begin, and we're gonna talk about our first question that we have today. Um, so I'm gonna put this question to all the panelists. So. As a young person or a person who works in the educational field or works with young folks, um, what does effective cannabis education mean and look like to you? Um, so I can, does Sylvia, do you wanna go? Yeah, I'll start. <laughs> um, so I think at the forefront, it's harm reduction based. Um, I grew up with fear-based tactics, which were definitely not effective. 
Um, I don't know if anyone knows of the D.A.R.E. program, but it, it definitely had a very different approach. Um, and so, yeah, I think at the forefront, it, it really has to be harm reduction. It has to be fact based and it has to include lived experience. Yeah, I think that's um, beautifully said, like the aspect of lived experience I found is very effective and very important in context of talking to youth about cannabis youth because it does bring that personal connection um, and kind of gives youth kind of that window that allows them to kind of connect with it, whether they use it or whether they don't use it or whether they know folks. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that answer. I, I could add to that. Yeah. I could add something to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that I mean, also just like stripping the question down to its like most basic is like, what is a, like effective drug education or like cannabis education is can like cannabis or drug education that works. Um, like that sounds really basic, but like a lot of drug education just literally doesn't work. It, it's abstinence based. It's fe it mongers fear. Like if anything, like ineffective drug education is like perpetuates harm. Like it makes it more dangerous. People feel shamed. They don't talk about their drug use. They don't know where to access services. They don't, they don't feel like they can even talk about it. Um, and so effective drug education is essentially the opposite of that. That like makes people feel safe and welcome to share and ask questions. Um, as well as like uh, education that like listens as much as it talks almost as well. Like, like it's like as like a mutual shared learning experience, like where we're exploring this together, where there's less of a hierarchy as well. This is one of the big issues I have with education is when there's a hierarchy, which is why I think peer to peer is really effective. Thank yeah, you. I could also, oh, sorry. Oh, well, no, no, you could go. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would also, um, to, to add on to that, I think, you know, a lot of the way that education is generally taught is coming from that super top down perspective, which at this point, we know it doesn't work. So we need to stop pretending that it does um, actually engage in like a, in a non hierarchical manner with the people who are trying to educate. Um, in order to relay, like like has been said, like medically accurate, stigma free, and accessible information for youth that gets out of the punitive frameworks that we regularly tend to associate with drug education as a whole. I know for sure, um, speaking as a, a twenty year old, um, a current youth, um, as well as a youth educator, um, all of the education I had about cannabis. Um, prior to the past three years was all coming either from police officers or from teachers who were threatening punitive action in respects to drugs. Um, so taking away from that and kind of going into a space where everybody can be comfortable to actually discuss and have productive discourse, like Heath was saying, is really important in terms of just kind of refiguring how we actually treat drug education as a whole. Um, I'll just expand on that a little bit too more. Uh, it's just like what you are all saying is so effective. And I think also um, when youth are able to shape where the conversation is going. So an educator may have a direction on talking about certain things. Um, but if a youth feels comfortable enough to share their own experience of, you know, I tried edibles this weekend, I had a good experience or I had a really horrible experience or whatever it was, um, being able to adapt the conversation to not just stick to a structured uh, pattern, but to allow for that flexibility where youth is actually that comfortable that they can share um, what their experiences are and yeah, where the conversation is going. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, what you were saying before, like having, like, I'm 23. And I remember when I got, like, any sort of information about cannabis, it was from a police officer. And it was very intimidating. Like, you know, it's not an inviting space. And you aren't put in a position where you are comfortable to ask questions that you really want to. And that, like you were saying, he, it kind of inhibits that harm reduction lens that even um, it, it doesn't work, That what you were saying, that education doesn't work. And it's important to see that you'd see themselves when they're in that learning environment so that they feel comfortable so that whatever they're learning and listening to, it actually sticks. They're actually relating to it or learning from it and feel comfortable. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Well, can I actually just the piece about relatability too that you say there, mm -hmm. I think is so important too, because it's like, if you can't relate to it, if it's just numbers, if it's someone yeah. who doesn't look like you, who is just like, then it it, it, it really doesn't work. And then the fear and, and all of this makes it hard to relate. Like that's not effective. Education yeah. shouldn't be scary and unsafe. Like mm -hmm. maybe. 
And I think that's the cool part of having like peer to peer education, like you were saying earlier, because when you see a peer in that um, position, like you feel more comfortable to, to ask the questions that you really want to ask. Because I remember being in that health class being like, I don't want to actually ask the actual question that I want to ask to a police officer when I see his gear and everything. He might they might be the nicest person, but because of that visibility, it kind of puts that block like we were saying earlier that inhibits you from asking the questions and actually getting to the core of harm reduction even if like that you wants to use it or doesn't want to use cannabis or just trying to understand, you know, a healthy understanding of substances. It's it's what you're saying was very true. Yeah, like we we work with law enforcement with our program. Um, it's not something I've been supportive of, but it, it's just the way it is. And one of you know, from their perspective, one of the other challenges it's we it's creating an expectation that they know about substances, they know about harm reduction and whatnot, and they don't. Um, you know, we've had a consistent conversation with law enforcement about not wearing uniforms in the classroom. Um, and that is something that like often has to be explained, like they don't understand that. And so this is, you know, setting a, an expectation in the classroom that everyone's looking to police officers as if they really can talk about cannabis or substances and whatnot. And they're really just there to be enforcers of the law. And if we're going to ask them legal questions, they, sh you know, they can be that go to. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really not what we're there to talk about. And so it sets an expectation for them to know something that they don't really. Exactly. Like it's, it's almost like fear-based. Um, and any questions that they have to ask, it's like a little bit stringent on what they can and can't ask when they have that figure present in a classroom setting like that. And it also positions drug use as a criminal issue and not a public health issue, which is like, yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. Um, Absolutely. Uh, well, because with springboard and the weed out the risk, is still, it's like high driving, which is still criminalized. Like even if drug use isn't like it's still a criminalized act. So I can see why. But like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I digress. I, yeah, I don't want to mm -hmm. say much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. That stigma, it's it's attached to that, right? Like when when a person like that is there, it's like like you're saying law enforcement. That's that's kind of the narrative that is being depicted when we have a health class that's talking about cannabis or substance use like that. It's kind of just like. In a way, they're just kind of low key kind of saying like, no, abstinence is like the best answer, the only answer, which is, as we know, is not realistic. Um, and can I think, yeah, hard? I think for a lot of educators, that is their goal, though. Like that is what mm -hmm. they want. They want the youth to not be consuming at an early age or not at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So in their minds, they're like trying to achieve the, the goal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. So we're going to go to the next question that we have. And so um, based on your individual experiences and, you know, working in the field and even being a youth, what is a very pertinent issue or topic for youth surrounding cannabis that you've noticed that have might have come up that you've noticed that's repeatedly over these past couple of years um, working in cannabis education and, and being a part of that? I can maybe start us off on um, this one kind of also segues from what we were just talking about, especially with police officers in the classroom. Um, and it, it's more on the accessibility side of things. Um, Cause you know, with police officers, you're not really getting a, like a free flow of information. You're getting a stigma that stops people from being able to access the information that, or even, even feel like they want to go and access information about cannabis or about any drug use. Um, so a lot of times it comes up that either the sources that um, are available for information um, to to get to get like anything about cannabis really um, is either laden with um, academic jargon or comes from either a punitive like police or government source that isn't really actually looking to provide education but is more just looking to discourage from use. Um, and a lot of times what happens is either you can get either from those really heavy academic sources, like I'm talking like journal articles, psychological art, or more like psych heavy articles, like stuff like that, where you're getting like not actually accurate information. You know, you're getting people who read the conclusions, maybe don't fully understand maybe the, the cert or the sample design, all of that. Um, and that just kind of ends up creating kind of like two parallel dialogues of what's actually happening. Um, especially in terms of how people understand cannabis use. 
Um, so you either have like this like hyper like intellectual discussion of it, or you have this like really hyper like punitive discussion of it. And neither of them are actually are really easy to internalize, especially as somebody who doesn't necessarily have a, an academic background, can't necessarily read into all these like laws um, or government documents that are just so information heavy. Um, so you're getting people who may, may want to access information about cannabis, but they're not actually even able to really get to any of it in the first place, um, which is something that, you know, just even like in, in workshops that have done stuff like that, um, a lot of the questions are like, are, are rather like, like they should have easy answers. Like what's the difference between THC and CBD? Um, how does cannabis interact with my mental health? That one, a little bit more of a complicated answer to that one. Um, but a lot of them have answers, but people just aren't able to necessarily actually get to those answers. Or I just think accessibility is like a large issue that, that kind of runs throughout, throughout all of youth's interactions with, with trying to get cannabis information. Yeah, definitely like access to information, like you're saying, um, academic, having like those academic jargon can also like sway people from not wanting to, you know, truly understand or seek the answers that they really want to. And um, and even those who want to get that education, it can like, you know, sway them away from it because it's inaccessible, like you were saying. And it's very interesting that you brought up um, the topic about like, a very popular topic um, for youth is like wanting to know how cannabis interacts with like their mental health. I um, personally, for me, like working with cannabis and psychosis and working on, um, you know, some of the educational, um, you know, topics that we wanted to kind of convey and uh, we met with youth. Um, that was one of the big things that kind of came up is like trying to see how it interacts with mental health and, you know, um, with legalization happening and it's increasing and you see cannabis stores everywhere, the access to cannabis is so so high. And it's unfortunate that the information to safely, um, you know, learn about how to use cannabis safely um, isn't as accessible when, you know, um, cannabis is, is, is slowly coming in every corner. Like I live in Brampton and I see a dispensary in every corner and it's a suburb. This is not even like a city. Um, so it's, it's very... Um, you know, it is it is something alarming personally for me as a youth and also someone who kind of like is working in the educational um, cannabis um, kind of world. Um, seeing that this this answer to how it interacts with mental health isn't so clear and isn't like a one straight answer. And, you know, and I think that's why that work of cannabis education is so important and what you folks are all doing in your respective organizations. Yeah, I could add to I um because whenever we the workshops that we did were like co-designed by the youth that were participating in the workshops, so we had them rate like what areas they were the most interested in talking about so that we could kind of like prioritize those things. And um, like mental health and like health impacts were definitely really high with young people. Like that's like something that was, but I feel I feel like they're almost more concerned about the mental health impacts than the physical health impacts. And I don't know if it's just because I I mean, not that those aren't like obviously linked, but I feel like one of the things um, with the way young people like navigate these conversations is that they are like are, seem to be like seeking like a lot of nuance about things like, you know, they're like, what's the like relationship between cannabis and mental health? Like, and what is like the direction of that relationship? It's like, is, do I smoke more when I'm depressed or am I like depressed if I'm smoking more? Like, what does that mean? Also, like, how do I know if my use is medical use? Is it like recreational or is it medical? What is therapeutic use? Like, I don't know, like, um, I feel like, I don't know, young people get really into these questions, but then it's also like, just that youth aren't a monolith either and different young people have different areas of interest and concern about like cannabis related topics as well. So like queer youth, maybe you have this like, you know, this interest particularly in like the mental health aspect and like if it's like, um, versus like some youth, youth might be more concerned about like what their rights are and like the, the, how they can continue to be criminalized under legalization or, um, yeah, like youth that might be new to Canada are curious about the legal system versus like youth that are already lived, like some youth don't really seem as concerned about like the law or the regulatory system. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say yeah, kind of, it kind of depends, but, but stigma and like harm reduction seem to come up, I think as like a through line all the time is some, as something people are, young people are interested in is like, 
yeah, feeling bad about their cannabis use and like getting to them to the point where they can even recognize that they deserve harm reduction information if they're smoking weed. Cause like some of the stuff we've done with like the harm reduction on like smoking specifically, like you get some comments that like, oh, well it's not healthy. So there's no point, but it's like, even if you smoke weed, like you still have a right to health and a right to information, even if you use drugs, like any of this. Um, yeah. But so yeah, it kind of depends, but stigma and harm reduction are big ones. Uh, a big one for us is situational base. So we have a lot of the information to answer a lot of questions fairly straightforward as much as we can at the time at the moment. But when it comes to dealing with a youth after a workshop who says that their parents drive them to hockey practice every Wednesday high, how do I cope with that? I'm not in a position or is really anyone to really tell them what to do. Um, but these are challenging situations or what do I do when my friend like over consumes and greens out, like how do I help them? Because there's a ton of misinformation out there. So dealing with these unique situations like that, um, I think are, you know, where a lot of information is missing. Cause at the end of the day, a lot of the basic questions they have, like what are the legal consequences of getting pulled over high? Um, those can be answered online, you know, is it appealing on a government website? No, but you can get the answers. Um, but it's those situational ones that are much more challenging. The other issue is that um, I, I am the one that has to decipher through all those boring journal articles, and they are filled with content that is really dated. And the endocannabinoid system was only discovered in the 80s. Cannabis has changed drastically. In the 70s, it was 1% THC. And now we consume stuff that's 30% THC. Uh, a lot of people consume 99% pure extracts. So what does that mean on a 15-year-old's developing brain in comparison, right? We don't have that long-term data. It doesn't exist because it hasn't been really happening in a studied way. So the science and data really isn't there to have conclusive facts to, to tell them when it comes to a lot of these science-related questions. To add on to like the, the context-based situations, like, like completely agree with what you're saying. I think a lot of times in like the workshops that we've done, like, like a similar kind of like like Heath was saying as well, like, like youth are not a monolith, like you're going to be dealing with an entire like spectrum of like how people like, like their own relationship to youth, like how they like consider like their friends and family, like what levels of stigma they're subject to on a regular basis. So like, even when you're discussing with youth, like an important topic is just like acknowledging that you may not have like a monolithic answer to absolutely every question they have. Like, like you're saying, if it's more, you know, medically, based things like say what's THC, what's CBD, what's the endocannabinoid system, then you might have a more straightforward answer. But if you're, you know, trying to talk about how to maintain a healthy relationship with cannabis, it's going to be a lot more dependent on the individual, on their context, um, just how they interact with cannabis and how they interact with the world around them. So I think just like knowing that you can't necessarily have all the exact answers at the exact same or at, at the exact right time, but you can do your best to provide a harm reduction approach and to make sure that you feel safe in, in coming to you and talking about it. Um, it is one of the more important things that also comes up, you know, that, that, that kind of stays throughout the workshops. Yeah, particularly youth who come from households where it is not talked about and there will never be a sense of harm reduction in the home. It's going to be really challenging for them, even with, in an environment, in a classroom where you have a teacher who's, you know, really on board with harm reduction and, you know, gung ho about like having them feel comfortable. It's going to take a, a while for some of those kids to, you know, feel comfortable when that isn't what they know. Um, and that, you know, that can be really, you know, challenging, like you're saying, because some kids will be really receptive to um, that open nature conversation and jump right into it and share experiences. And some of those students who really need it, you know, they really want to talk about this stuff, but they just don't have that comfort um, is, is a huge barrier. Yeah, the, the diversity in, in youth for sure is, yeah, what you're saying. I think one of the nice things about the youth campaigns, though, is even when there aren't simple answers, you get to approach it as this mutual learning thing. Because the nice thing about young people, too, is they'll push back on stuff. Like, they also won't accept answers sometimes. Like, what, in a workshop, we were talking about, like, the spectrum of cannabis use and the and which is like, you know, it's just something you use if you work in drug policy and you, like you talk about the spectrum of drug use, but they're like, this is oversimplified. It's more of a spectrum. And I'm just like, honestly, I'm here for it. Like push back. Like don't ex like, yeah, it's, it's one of the challenges of youth education, but it's also one of the like exciting parts of it. But 
Yeah. Thank you. And um, as I was like hearing your answers, I was also reflecting on like um, some of like the youth that I talked to. And when I was working um, with educational materials for cannabis, it's like there's also folks who um, are unaware of or, or don't have an idea about what to ask about cannabis, too. And I find that was also a challenge as well, especially because they didn't know um they didn't know, like like you were saying, Heath, like the intersectionalities of how cannabis can kind of interact um, with different social issues, um, like your identity, um, you know, your your current politics that you're in, where you're living. Those are all things that you know um, play an influence on cannabis use. And I remember when I was talking about this with my peers and fellow youth, um, a lot of uh, youth didn't even realize those were issues and. Um, you know, it, it just goes to show how important education is and how much how important these campaigns are to kind of create those dialogues and create those awareness. And like you're saying, creating those critical conversation where youth are pushing back, youth are thinking critically. And they're like, you know what? No, it's more complex than just, you know, a yes or no black or white answer. And um, that's all true. And, and we're seeing right now that research and we're all seeing that information coming out now after legalization and, you know, Canada and North America has been leaders trying to figure out um, what those intersections are. And we're still figuring out and finding those answers together. And I think that's why peer to peer, um, you know, hearing those peer to peer voices are so important and so um, great in this time. All right. Great. So I'm going to go to the next question um, that I'm going to ask everyone. So what does your ideal cannabis education landscape look like? Um, and what are you building towards in, the, in, in aspects of, you know, um, educating youth amongst ca uh, for cannabis and harm reduction and the work that you are continuing to do? So this really depends on the community. We had a third party consultant evaluate how um, we're working with indigenous communities and what we can do to better meet their needs. And a strategy that they had implemented was doing a talking circle strategy. So, you know, rather than a typical presentation of the slides, you know, just have everyone in a talking circle. And I love that. Wouldn't necessarily incorporate it, incorporate it in downtown Toronto um, in the exact same type of way, of course. But, you know, I think, um, like I'd mentioned earlier, just having things much more driven in the conversation and where things are going by the youth and then having the information available so that when we're talking about driving, you know, we can pull up that information on the legal, social, financial risks of driving. We're talking about um, you know, mental health, we can pull up, okay, what's the relationship with psychosis, um, or, you know, depression and other things. So we can look at, you know, them organizing the content in a comfortable format for them. I, I, I would, I could add to that. Um, well, cause I think, um, building off of that, like, it, community led education is is awesome. So when it's youth led, that's great. Like if you can relate to the people that are leading the conversations, um, that goes a really long way. Um, like, I don't know, for example, like our Get Sensible campaign is, is great in that it's led by young people, but like me and the other lead on the project are both white, which is a huge limitation. We're not like well positioned to like be leading work and, and like communities that don't relate to us. We're queer and trans, which is cool, but like it's it only goes so far. Um, which is why I think people really need to, um, I'd like to see more money invested like from the government in like education campaigns that are smaller and localized that can be led by, like that would be great. Like if it wasn't just like all like more corporate um, and impersonal and then like, I don't know, within these systems, I think that also goes a long ways is that there's such limitations to education that happens within institutional systems, whether it's like from within healthcare or education systems, there's just a lot of bureaucracy and red tape. Um, it, like there's politics wrapped up in all of it. Um, so when it's like grassroots community led initiatives, you can really do what you want. And it's like, and that's usually if, if it's for your community, it's also what your community needs because it's what you need. Um, and that, that looks good. And I think it goes a long way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like just, just a note on that as well. Um, definitely like, what ideal cannabis education does not look like is an over-commercialized cannabis education. Um, because I think we can all see um, how that's gone in terms of just legalization. 
Um, but I think like you're saying, like when you have like community organizations who are doing it, like you have more localized organizations, they are best positioned to meet the needs of their community. Um, you know, in, in just the context of the work with um, VoxCan, we kind of just do it in terms of, um, of just listening to youth in terms of round tables mostly. Um, we don't tend to do a lot of workshops. Um, we do them when they're requested, um, but mostly we try to engage in more of a conversation process than anything else. Because ultimately, while we're there to like guide what's going on and to kind of provide um, those like facts and resources if we need them, um, our model is trying to just work off of what people actually say they need. Because ultimately, like we're not gonna know what's best for whatever school we're going into unless we actually have that conversation and they tell us what's best for their environment, what they actually want to know. Um, so I think just, you know, echoing your sentiments, like you can't really have like a one size fits all approach, A, and B, like you need to just actively like engage, listen to, and also empower the people who you are talking to or hoping to like educate in order to like actually have like a hand and a role in their own education and the direction that that education is going to bring them in ultimately. Yeah, I have definitely found this as an effective strategy for older teens. Um, working with younger youth, I don't find it to be as effective. I think a lot of times they just have no idea what to ask. Um, they may have an older sibling who they can like bounce some like big experience off of and maybe create a question, but I've done workshops where I've, you know, walked in and been like, what do you guys want to know? Like, let's just, you know, like keep it casual. Like what's, what's up? What do you guys want to know? Um, and they're just kind of like all, you know, like, I don't know what to say. And, you know, it, it's with especially younger kids, I think, you know, is a balance of finding that structure. Um, but yeah, not overstepping on what they want to say and letting them feel free to ask questions. Yeah, I think that that's like a good reminder too, that there's different strategies for different needs. Like, you know, there's different people and age ranges and like context will resonate with different things. But Emma, I really like the the Vox can approach so much, like the the pit, bit about like education that like listens as much as it talks or something like that, just because it's it's an exchange. Like it's like otherwise, like young people don't feel like they have anything to invest if they aren't going to be listened to. Like you just want them to sit there and listen at like at least old. Like our demographic is 17 to 24. So at 25, it's like older youth. But like in terms of what would have worked for me as a young person smoking weed when I was 16, like out of like, I don't know, would have been like, yeah, being listen to and being able to ask questions and not just like being assumed what I should know or like, um, yeah, like that isn't presumptuous as well, because that's one of the things like where in our harm reduction messaging, we, you know, it's like, we want to say, you know, don't drive high. Um, but because of the way young people respond to that kind of like negative assumption that that's what they're going to do, we found they respond better to like have a plan, like this positive reinforcement that like it, that has faith in the people that are engaging with it, that they're going to make good decisions and that like, like just is empowers them instead of just like kind of maybe being a bit on the like defense or like, you know, anyway, but yeah, no, I, I totally understand that, especially with like just the concept of right and wrong. Like we've, you know, there's people who naturally just want to say like, don't drive high, it's wrong. Like it's just bad and a wrong choice and it's illegal. So don't do it. Um, how is someone going to receive that? You know, especially if you're facilitating in like an indigenous community and you're like some white person there coming there saying like what's right and what's wrong. Right. But there's um, some great campaigns and ads out there that are used positive messaging um CAA is one of them they just developed four videos um you know do anything else but you drive high and just like that yeah basic question of how could you get home safe like what are your options and having that like group discussion and having students flow in the class of being like oh yeah you can take like bus number three and then well that ends at 11 30 so you'd have to take this bus and like them working out how they can get home safely um is really cool to like just watch that like brain fire happen in the room and I think a lot of like, like in terms of like, you know, the positive messaging, like bringing like these strategies that are actually like, like usable strategies instead, like kind of goes back to just like, what does an ideal cannabis education landscape look like? Because like, ideally there's no stigma in the cannabis education landscape. Like that's like what, what I would say, like, like VoxCan is like working towards like amongst other things, obviously, but like when you're giving like messages and like, like take this bus home like you're saying like instead of like driving high like you're presenting information and you're asking questions and you're doing engagement in a way that like 
like make sure that you're not reinforcing the stigma as as an educator yourself so it's like in our education like we have the power to like to like get away from like that first step that will create a barrier to like every other step that we want to achieve like just through like the different strategies like like even to different audiences like you're saying thank you everyone that's beautifully said um i agree a hundred percent like what you we all mean by like engaging i think education is important when you bring community within within that and whether that means you have different perspectives and you have visibility where youth can see themselves in those educational landscapes so that they feel comfortable to you know learn and engage with that and and also i think um it was, it was very beautiful what you said keith what you're saying you know you want to give youth the power you want to give them the belief the trust that you know um, they're not, they're, they're, they, they can make good decisions for themselves. And, you know, we, are, as educators, as, uh, folks who create these, um, you know, um, educational settings for youth to learn more about this information is just, we just want to give them trust. We want to have them engage and see themselves in that education. And I think that's a very important thing, um, to have in our landscape. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to go to our next question. Um, so how do you ensure that your content is relevant and resonates with youth, youth in various communities that you work with? I could, I could, Emma, are you going to say, shift? I'll go quick. I'll try. I'll be, I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, basically we've already talked about it, but like we're a youth led campaign. So it's like easy. We don't need like a youth content team to review things because it's like everyone on our team is a young person. So we're just making content that we like and that is re like resonates with us. So it's like, presumably, um, with like the peer leaders and the broader, like get sensible team, we prioritized like hiring diverse perspectives so that we could like pick brains and like really, I don't know, just do a better job in terms of making it relevant and, and have people on our team that were better positioned to like lead, I don't know, certain conversations and things like that, um, that we got them to review like all of our materials as like, and have like a collaborative discussion about like what, what representation looked like in terms of like accessibility, body types, um, hair types, like gender, all kinds of things, like in terms of like the representation in our materials, um, as well as like, um, yeah, we use humor a lot, I would say as well. Like we have like a, a, a fantastic creative team. So we have like all these like lovely illustrations, some of which are controversial because they depict young people consuming cannabis, but that's part of our like destigmatizing approach is like to actually show that it is a thing that happens. Um, and then humor is a is a big one because, you know, the, the opposite of like fear and like the, the fear mongering approach, I feel like that makes you feel unsafe is like humor and comedy is like very comforting. So people respond really well to it, especially Gen Z because they're like the younger generation, like this, like, cause, because we are all very traumatized and we humor, we like, it helps. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, like I like absolutely love get sensibles, um, like humor approach, even with like, um, like real drug stories and, and that kind of um, bit of like the campaign and knowledge mobilization and all that. It's, it's an excellent Instagram account. Um, that's just about people's drug stories that you submit for anybody watching um, if you want to see it. Um, but it, it's such a good platform because you can just like get like, like it's like some of them are humorous, like some of them are a bit like, like more serious, but like you can kind of get like an active engagement going like just from that. Um, but I like, I love that approach for it. Um, I think in terms of like Box Can, you know, we're a bit of a smaller team um, in, in respects to Get Sensible um, and all that. Um, but I think just like the the approach that we use is is meant to be tailored to each specific school or um, like educational institution that we go into. So pretty much usually like we'll either contact or be contacted by a school, whether it be a, a high school, a CEGEP, um, an adult ed center. Um, and the whole thing is that we go in, we have a round table with um, the, the class um, or, or a group of students there, listen to what they have to say, listen to what things they find most important. And then after that, we go and talk to educators um, and kind of act as the intermediary between youth and educators, um, because otherwise that conversation might be a little bit uncomfortable. They might not want to have it in that way, um, et cetera. So in terms of how we 
just make sure that it's relevant. Um, also, our team, um, like I said, I am 20. Um, I am a youth, as they say. Um, most of our team, I think the majority of our team consists of people who are technically youths. Um, so once again, we just make sure that we're kind of keeping it cordial. We're not using like these giant, like crazy words um, around cannabis and cannabis education. Um, try to keep language accessible around everything and just make sure that like we're actually actively listening and engaging with the students that we are talking to. Um, I, once again, I, I can't speak to a, a much wider level of engagement um, that the other two experts here might have just because we are in Montreal. Uh, based and uh, disseminated uh, program instead, but in terms of just kind of making sure that we have a dialogue with whichever school we're we're in um, we're in with, yeah, yeah. But don't but don't sell yourself short because there's benefits to being a local effort as opposed to a national effort in terms of like what you can achieve in like local community, like you know. So like it's different, yeah. but like they're it, yeah, good good for both. Well, one of our tenants that I like, I think is like, like, especially like fun and like interesting for Montreal, which is part of the advantage of just being based in Montreal is that we're completely bilingual, like all of our documents, resources, etc, are available in French and English. Um, our workshops and our um, roundtables are done in French or English, depending on the school. So we are able to like tailor to a certain level. Um, just kind of our programs and, and who we actually interact with, which is, which is really nice. Thank you. Thank you for the boost, Heath. I appreciate it. Um, so We Don't The Risk has about 15 videos in the program. Not all are shown in a workshop. It's selective uh, for the facilitator to choose which ones they want to show. Most of the videos are done by Mad Canada. So their processing of, of how they do it, um, you know, is just a professional uh, media company. I don't know, uh, you know, um, the details within that. We have created some of our own for the program. Um, our process with that was having it all reviewed by youth. So I created a script for one of our recent PSAs, had it reviewed and produced it. And then... Um, had it reviewed um, by a number of youth. And I found this effective, but I would also say not perfect. In an ideal situation, we would have actually hired a youth um, to completely been involved with the creation of it and from the whole the whole way through. Um, and so, yeah, I think that was one of the gaps, of course, from a, yeah, I, I'm, from like a financial perspective, I don't think the comp I don't know how it works with the company hiring, um, you know, a, a teenager to do that. But um, yeah, that just might, there might be some certain barriers there I'm not quite sure of. Um, bilingual is also a really big challenge for us. We have Pas de Volant, C'est Pas Trippant, which is our French version of We Don't Risk. And though it has content that delivers um, to Quebecois youth, it's very different French and slang and legal terms than for um, the New Brunswick youth or the, or the um, Francophone youth in New Brunswick or in Alberta. So it's hard to meet everyone's needs definitely when it comes to the language and media content. Um, but obviously having the, the visual representation of diversity um, is, I think, at the forefront of um, what a lot of our media has. And of course, showing youth um, themselves, not, you know, adults only in the situation, though we do have a few videos with adults. And we like to like acknowledge like this isn't just a youth issue like cannabis and driving. We're not trying to say it's just youth and we're just targeting like new drivers. It's like your parents might do it, you know, family members like it's. You know, and they didn't receive this education, so it's not just a youth conversation. Yeah, I'll actually chime in if we're speaking to the language aspect in terms of like reaching various communities. Like, get sensible. We try to be pretty bilingual. We're more Anglo for sure, but we try and do some of the bilingual engagement. And then our our cannabis education toolkit is, is actually available now in Punjabi, simplified Ch Chinese, and Mandarin, and um, Spanish as well. Um, those are all available for download on our website. We didn't end up doing the redesign. Well. With the translation, we you know hired the company, but then we also hired youth from those communities to review it to make sure because like it's one thing to hire like a company, but it's someone else something different to hire someone from the community, especially because like there's slang and there's and the phrasing is very you know and the youth did more work than the company in terms of catching like you know these like little linguistic nuances so that it would be actually in relatable language. Um, and then we, we didn't, you know, do the redesign in those languages just, just because the imagery might not have been culturally relevant. Um, so we did like we knew our, our limitations there and just kept it to the French and English. But um, 
But yeah, the translation piece. Oh, and then Emma, earlier you mentioned accessibility too. And accessibility is a huge thing in terms of the graphic design of our resources too, because we want it to be able to reach everyone. So like visual accessibility, like stuff that's not like sensory overload, like we're very, it's the accessibility, accessible design is like something that we try to always be on top of, like the image descriptions on, on our socials and stuff like that, captions in our videos, um, just like another piece in terms of like reaching people in communities. But. Yeah, the other um, the other topic on media that I, I forgot to bring up is um, also coming in with a trauma informed framework because we did have one video that had a crash ending, um, and to the average person, like it might not seem like a, a major deal, but if you've you know particularly if you're a young person, um, but if you've been in a crash recently or lost someone that you care about into a collision. Um, you know, that's obviously a devastating thing to see. And so having that disclaimer prior to putting on certain videos, you know, or, you know, some schools ask us not to show that video to the seven and eights, uh, grade seven and eights. So yeah, you, you know, you obviously have to find out like what's going to hit the mark, but also, you know, not be triggering for folks as well. If I you're talking was about something heavy. I was triggered by the boat ad because I was in a boat explosion this summer that was really like traumatic. And then I started, I was talking about the boat accident and then I got the Mad Canada high driving boat accident ads. Specifically, I think the algorithm heard me talking about my boat accident. And then I was like, this is a recipe, but I, don't, I digress, that's an aside, but it, the trigger warnings are relevant, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can't get that on social media. I mean, yeah, a person can say it in a workshop, but social media won't do it. Just to quickly go back to, to Heath, something you said that I also think is important to like foreground a little bit away from um, the, the last couple conversations. Um, but just about like, like paying youth who you're involving in your projects is extremely, extremely important. Like we as educators, as researchers, as whatever, like like we should not be going into a community and just extracting information, um, taking youth expertise and turning it into like a product that we can use without like any monetary compensation. Um, I think especially like just one of the things that Boxcan did was a podcast series with some youth, um, kind of a la Ask the Expert style, but just um, directly between youth and um, an educator on either health, uh, social, legal aspects of cannabis. Um, but like the difference in like youth reception and ability and like willingness to like share and be a part of your content is just offering to pay and like giving like the proper the proper weight to the labor that youth is providing for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the issues that we had um, with you know potentially hiring a youth to direct and script write and do the full works is when the like there's not like a whole lot of experience there um, in comparison to a professional to to make it like as high level you know for the budget we had um, but as well like we were filming until like three in the morning and for a teen who like has school the next morning like will their parents even allow that so they're definitely like finding you know, like a youth who can kind of like meet the demands of something if you are working on a really heavy project, um, you know, just thinking through those steps really thoroughly. Because yeah, the, absolutely, you can't ask people for work without pay. I think we're past the point of, you know, l normalizing um, free labor, right? So yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, you, you, I was I'm just about to say that too. And that's something that Cannabis and Psychosis we've been doing. And so we're a team that is led by, all, most of our team is all youth. And, you know, um, we go by the motto, you know, for youth, by youth. And the course that we're working on, the educational materials and the things that we kind of put out is all made by youth, a, a group of youth. And like you're saying, like, you know, um, a lot of these youth, they, ha they have school, They're, they have a lot of priorities. And, you know, it's important to, you know, show that, you know, they their voice is of value and whether that means is like you're properly compensating them you know you're inviting them to meetings and you know you're listening to them and their voices and keeping them engaged and um like many of you folks were saying is um for a lot of the content that we, we created is having youth from we tried our best to have youth across the country because it's a national project um in different parts of provinces and such um to kind of um like give us feedback and also engage and um, with the content and you know 
it, it's amazing how how smart the youth are like you know I was we I learned so much from them and they gave us ideas and we tried our best to you know have their voice heard you know this is what youth are thinking and I think that's a very important thing to incorporate when you're creating content for youth is having their voice listening to them and you know hearing them like what's working what's not working um is the language we're using too academic is it not making sense you know that's something that we came across as as like we want to make sure that the content is accessible like we were saying earlier we don't want to have that academic jargon we want it to be relatable and also answer the questions that they want to have answered um, so incorporating youth in different parts from like planning to evaluation and in between, I think is a very important aspect in creating content that relates because it's for youth and it would make it would make no sense to not involve them throughout the process and, you know, also respect, you know, their education and, you know, the work that they do. Um, you know, we've had youth and teens um, from the ages of like 14 to like 25 be incorporated because we wanted to make sure that, you know, we hear all um, variety of voices from all different backgrounds, from all different intersectionalities, because essentially, you know, that's what, you know, the youth of Canada is. We want to make sure that we cater to their needs, which can be difficult. And I think that's what, why it's important to have as much youth um, and different perspectives as possible. And also um, involving the community around that youth in that content, I find was um, very important. And what I mean by that is like having educators, teachers, um, you know, parents, um, and having you know, and people with lived experiences or non-lived experiences also be involved when we're talking about cannabis education um, to, to try to give that holistic, um, you know, perspective or voice. And I think we do have some questions from the audience. So um, Christopher Somerville, um, they asked a question, which is, um, I think, referring to the question before this one, which was um, they asked every culture responds to every other culture as to what is right or wrong. So do we follow science or personal anecdotal experiences? It can start us off for, for this question. Um, well, I think a lot of the line that we draw between um, science and say personal anecdotal experiences is often kind of arbitrary, especially when we're talking about, you know, really incorporating like youth perspectives. Um, like obviously there's like a scientific rationale um, behind everything um, or, you know, like integrated into everything, but it doesn't have to necessarily be opposed to how personal experiences go. Because a lot of times the personal experiences that like youth will discuss and say our roundtables or workshops will be supported by science and be like within like what we know about cannabis, like within our existing scientific framework. Um, however, what's missing is just kind of the connection and like that accessible translation of like, okay, so we know you have this experience. How can we understand it from these different perspectives? And how can I bring kind of like my understanding of how, you know, maybe the body or mental health interacts with cannabis to what you've experienced to make you understand it better and also make sure that your peers and, you know, just your educators and, and the people around you as a whole understand it uh, better. If that this is not a complete answer by any means, but um, it's a start at least. Well, no, because I could add to that as well in terms of like, um, well, I don't know, just that like, you know, drug education has been like heavily moralized in terms of like getting into this false dichotomy of like white, right and wrong, like very black and white thinking about things and like same with sex education. I was in a Catholic school, so it was very much like the moralizing of like innate human behaviors was not productive for like having healthy conversations or mobilizing evidence. Um, but in terms of like, you know, if we follow science or personal anecdotal experiences, like I, it can be both. Like if the, it like, you know, if it isn't just like the anecdotal is like, morally, I think this is wrong. If like, it can be science of like evidence and statistics, but then tying that to relevant lived experience that actually like, makes that those that science uh, relatable and real like m people don't respond to science they respond to other people and what they go through <laughs> um so like that's definitely how we kind of are trying to do our education and our knowledge mobilization is by like you know defaulting to evidence and science-based 
you know, the science both around like cannabis and the science around like drug education and what is effective, all of these things. Um, but then also like making that relevant by tying it to people's lived experience as well. Yeah, I would say um, responding to drug education in morality of right and wrong when it's very transient based on time isn't really going to hold well. Um, it's very complex. I mean, when we look at when cannabis first came to Canada, I mean, King Henry was like giving thousands of dollars to people to grow cannabis crops. And like, then we have people like being criminalized for even talking about it. And now we have it legalized. Like, it's not static, but we can like morally try to define as right and wrong. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of like, are we following science or personal experience like those are very much also entwined like science does follow personal experience like that's what science is based off of is lived so i wouldn't separate right and wrong and i also wouldn't separate science and personal experience yeah i agree um like what you're saying science kind of follows personal experiences and what studies it in in many ways and i think um like everyone was saying is i think Right or wrong is I think it's important that we pay attention to both science and personal experiences because there's truth to both of them, right? Um, like when we were looking at like the history of cannabis, for example, like, you know, um, there's many like, you know, traditional cultures and religions who've had their own truths and their own experiences and, um, you know, what was right and wrong in terms of cannabis and how they used it. Um, and I think it, you know, it's, it varies in, in people's personal experiences and how they understand life and how, um, you know, their teachings are. So I think um, having a mix of both is, is very important and critical when, when talking about an educational lens and also science, um, unfortunately doesn't always have the answers um, to lived experiences, not yet, right? Sometimes it's uh, it's still coming, you know, academia, there's, a, there's sometimes there's a saying that they say that academia is a bit behind in personal experiences. It kind of follows after. So I think it's important that we pay attention to both and kind of create that holistic understanding that way. Yeah, I mean, science has only really progressed with can with education because of people's use of it and then legalization. Prior to legalization, the amount of funding that went into academic research on THC and the endocannabinoid system was significantly less. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, you know, like you're saying, like research is only emerging now. And so like, we'll only find out like, you know, there's a lot of answers that we're still um, yet to find out or being published in like, you know, academic journals. And so I think that's, that's, that's why it's important that we have a hybrid of that personal experiences. And, you know, in cannabis and psychosis, we, um, we try to incorporate, you know, those with lived experiences to speak their truth, you know, to speak what happened to them, because there is um, a lot of truth to it, because it's what they lived through. And, you know, um, and and that way, a lot of people can even like, you know, understand, see themselves or resonate. And, and you know, we can see um, different truths because, you know, people are different. We come from different backgrounds and um, there's always different truths to many situations in that way. All right. Thank you, everyone, for answering that. Um, I think we have another question from Christopher as well. And it was, do you feel that you make a clear uh, correlation between cannabis use and the possibility of cannabis and psychosis? Um, I guess I could I could start this off uh, <laughs> considering, you know, cannabis and psychosis in the name that um, we have. I think um, in, in our organization and, and in the work that we do, um, having a clear correlation, we, we do try our best to kind of use scientific, um, you know, like we're saying, using the hybrid of science and lived experiences. You know, there has been correlations between cannabis use and the possibility of, you know, psychosis induced by that. Um, so, you know, I think we kind of kind of um, use lived experiences as well to kind of highlight that or showcase that because it's important to, you know, show that 
um, you know, this is ha this has happened to people, you know, it's, it's something that has occurred and, you know, it has truth and it has merit to it. And so there is correlation. And, you know, I think in the work that we do, in the work that we show that, you know, people are different, you know, whether that's genetics, the backgrounds that they come from, the social, you know, determinants of our lives, you know, so many things are so, uh, um, you know, kind of impact that. So, it's important that um, there, there, there can be correlations and it's, it, there can be a link for psychosis for some folks. And, you know, we know that there's a predisposition for certain genetics for folks, you know, a family history, for example, and things like that. So I feel like in the education that we do, we try to make sure that we create perspective, um, show showcase perspectives that um, show the different truths um, so that, you know, um, there, there is, like we were saying before, there isn't one size fit all for an answer, especially when you're talking about health, right? Um, so yeah. I, I would I would love to add to that um, because like, I think part of what I like about the way that um, cannabis and psychosis like addresses the cannabis and psychosis, psychosis uh, question is that they are platforming people who have gone through it. Um, and so it isn't in a way that's like kind of exploitative and ableist, frankly, because a lot of the cannabis causes schizophrenia stuff is super ableist for people with schizophrenia. Like, it's like, that's the worst case scenario. You know what I mean? Is that like, you'll end up like this person. And I was a mentally ill young person. I've had experiences of psychosis. So that fear messaging, like, like that position mental illness and psychosis or schizophrenia, conflating psychosis and schizophrenia as well. And like, you know, exacerbating uh, misunderstandings and stigma about mental health um, were t com incredibly harmful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in, in some ways that, that approach um, is just not helpful. It mongers fear and stigma about drug use and mental illness. Um, but cannabis and psychosis has a much more realistic approach because it's people like me was someone who has had cannabis and related psychosis and in which was like considered cannabis induced psychosis. But I recognize like many intersecting factors that led to that predisposition considering it happened to me and it didn't happen to my friends and that it's very nuanced and that like psychosis is a symptom of many other mental illnesses. Um, and like it's schizophrenia and psychosis are related, but not the same, you know, just bringing this nuance by platforming people that actually um, have that lived experience expertise um, to like reduce the stigma and make it less scary to talk about because psychosis is scary for people. It's scary if you're going through it, scary if someone you know is going through it, um, but it's less scary if you just talk about it. And same with drug use in general, but that's, my, that's what I, I would maybe say about that. I will say like on, on your point of like the fear mongering around it, um, like, Obviously, um, I believe y'all are both better um, better positioned to answer the actual link question better than I, but in, in all the workshops that I have done, um, that I've read the notes for, um, the relationship between cannabis and psychosis is one of the most widely cited things by students who we talk to. It comes up like very, very frequently, and it is very much in the way of like, like fear mongering about it rather than having, you know, a, productive conversation and, and we're fortunate enough that we have a, a medical doctor on our team who can properly explain the link um, in more of the cannabis and psychosis style of things um, but just like it, it's present in pretty much every single workshop or roundtable we do like it's one of the most commonly cited things yeah I start off answering this with you know the disclaimer that I'm not in science I'm you know I'll share with you what I know but my my education is limited on this um, but there are some really good resources and some people I really look to in this field um, but the bullet points I give students are that one does it run in your family and that's complex because older generations didn't talk about mental health so you might presume that there's no one in your family that suffered um, you know from you know an array of mental health challenges that have had links with cannabis um, you might not know so just be wary of that if you're using it as your guiding point of deciding whether or not to use if that's something that, you know, you have, you know, concerns around. Um, when do you choose to use, you know, you who the younger you use, the higher your rate goes um, for, you know, developing psychosis or any sort of mental health challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, how are you using, is it illegal cannabis versus legalized or medicinal? And, 
that, you know, the potential of having laced cannabis is like a risk, right? So, you know, if you are choosing to use illegal cannabis, then you're going to run a higher risk of not knowing the percentage or what it, what it has. Um, and then as well, the, the final point that I give is that if you're choosing to, to help you um, self-diagnose or sorry, not self-diagnose, um, like help you cope, um, but not from a medical professional, but like, let's say you're struggling with depression or anxiety and you choose to use cannabis um, at like as your solution to help cope with that, that can be risky because the strain of cannabis that you could be using could actually be triggering more anxiety or things like that. Um, so yeah, like you're not using medical perspective in your guidance of what you're consuming. So these are all things when we, you know, we first started having this conversation, we talked about harm reduction and I'm just giving you the tidbits on how, um, from what I've learned, this is how you can reduce the harm. If that's something that you're concerned about, like you both said, you know, eloquently, there's no need to be like looking at schizophrenia, um, or mental health challenges as like, it's the worst thing in the world. These are not things that need to be stigmatized, but if it is something that you're asking or have concerns about, then, you know, those are my, um, areas of expertise on how to reduce the harm. Thank you, everyone. Great. Um, so I think we're going to uh, go to our next question. I'm just going to see if we have any more questions in the audience. So I'm just going to go to the next question. Um, so it's now been three years since Canada has legalized cannabis. And so how has this impacted the communities that you've worked with that you've noticed or the communities you're a part of? And have the needs of youth changed during this time um, now that cannabis has legalized? Um, and, and are there any patterns that you've noticed? I can start by just speaking into the into the Quebec context um, because um, yeah, Quebec, although the federal age of uh, cannabis um, legislation has been left up to individual provinces um, for a while in Quebec, it was 18. Um, by a while, I mean for, I don't know, like five or six months, maybe maximum. Um, and then the government changed it to um, 21. Um, so what that has kind of done in cannabis education um, to put it simply, is is not phenomenal um, because you have a bit more of that stigmatization creeping in from the government, um, as well as a lot of, I, I know we've been talking about the CAA campaigns, um, which I also am a big fan of. Um, every time I see them, I giggle a little bit, um, but that stands in stark contrast to the campaigns by uh, the Quebec government, um, which often uh, have very fearsome images of balloons popping, saying anxiety, uh, like dark backgrounds, all that kind of stuff. Um, so while it's legalized, it is still pretty heavily stigmatized um, in kind of the social sphere, especially in Quebec. Um, I can't speak that much to other provinces. Um, you know, I've gone to the dispensary in Ontario, um, which is nice, uh, but I don't know much about their their campaigns or anything like that. Um, but in, just in terms in terms of access to like like cannabis A, um, and then information around cannabis again, um, the kind of regression from 18 to 21 um, has significantly impacted it, that it like it is no longer as much of like a safe thing to be talking about or to be um, consuming necessarily. Also the switch between, at, at, for having the age start off at age 18 and then switching several months later um, ended up pretty much opening up a, a regulated cannabis market to youth, first of all, um, where, you know, there was the implication that this was going to be safe, regulated cannabis, um, and then closing that market off subsequently, making people go back to um, dealers who they may not know the percentage of necessarily, they may not know the exact products they're getting necessarily. Um, this isn't to say that all um, dealers are, you know, giving bad cannabis out or anything like that. It's just saying you don't necessarily have like all the packaging information in the same way. Um, I would just describe it as 
regressive. So the need for information around cannabis is kind of even more as well as the impacts of what actually like going to getting like cannabis from a dispensary versus getting cannabis from a dealer. Um, it just requires a bit more like targeted education about risk factors to maybe be aware of when purchasing cannabis. Um, I also just think it's like led to like a lot of confusion in terms of how cannabis is regulated, um, how it's distributed, like a lot on the legal side, like whenever we're giving workshops about um, more on the legal aspects of cannabis, the, the differences between, you know, federal legislation, provincial legislation, and municipal legislation can be like extremely different. And lots of times you're not going to like, like, I don't know a lot of legal language myself. It's very hard to like understand some of the different overlapping layers of government that all regulate cannabis in different ways and might have like different you know, kind of decision processes around that. One of the examples would be in Quebec, there's the ongoing decision about whether or not you can grow your own cannabis plants at home or not. Um, every single time we talk about it, there's always confusion about it. The courts like go kind of back and forth about whether or not you can. Um, so there's just not really like a lot, like there's not a very unified, a unified program of understanding cannabis since uh, legalization, especially with all the different levels of government that all have different responsibilities and different ways of implementing things around cannabis. And then there's the complexity of Ontario youth going to Quebec and being even more confused. <laughs> oh, Heath, I think you're muted. It's because it's so I don't get too excited, but I'm picturing it was a nice all, miming exercise. <laughs> I'm just shadow boxing, no. Um, but I'm picturing all of the like 18 year old Ontario kids going to Quebec for their alcohol and all the 19 year old like Quebec kids going to Ontario for their weed, which is just like actually like it's, it's just like it's bad for the environment, it's unnecessary risk that you have to like go out of your way to access this drug now. It's like it's interesting, Emma, what you said about how it's like still stigmatized but also like more regulated so there's like more rules it, it it is less cool i think now we can all agree that weed's less cool than it was before um which is a goal of the government was to make it just seem like something your parents did um but like yeah i mean you know the sign like the can Canadian cannabis surveys coming out with like, you know, if the rates of youth cannabis use have like gone down and we weren't sure they might've gone up because people would have felt more comfortable to disclose, but we haven't seen that like rise that people like had anticipated would happen. Like weed would be legal. And then all the kids that were already smoking weed, were going to smoke more weed. I don't know. We already had a lot of kids smoking weed here when it was legal. So, um, but yeah, I think the confusion, people feeling like a little maybe like disenfranchised about weed, like it used to be like a more of a community thing and now it's a corporate thing, which frankly is like not as fun. Um, there's the more packaging waste associated with it. Like it's just, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, there's branding and marketing. It's capitalist weed now. Like that's one of the, one of the big changes, I suppose. Um, none, I'm kind of a weed jaded person also because I was like a big advocate for legalization but I'm more caught up on what hasn't gone well so I'm mostly I think talking about the things that are only okay but um, I'll cut myself because I think we have a few more questions I want to get to the questions about the content like uh, censorship as well if we get to them but I'm going to cut myself off because I can go on um, yeah, I mean, as far as communities go, I think just the pop up of stores has been the big thing. I think everything else hasn't been the pandemonium that everyone expected prior to legalization. Um, slight rises in, in use uh, in certain demographics. It's like really nothing astronomical or anything that related to the fear mongering that happened um, during the whole um, 2018 frenzy. But uh, yeah, I, I think the other, you know, change, I wouldn't say this is related to legalization per se, but of course, is the increase of use of edibles and vaping with very little knowledge around um, the risks around or how to safely consume those. Um, yeah, I, I guess I could speak on um, what I've, I've noticed personally. Um, I think with the legalization of cannabis, I think, um, at least in Ontario and the GTA, what I've noticed, there's an oversaturation of cannabis everywhere. It's in your face. It's everywhere. If you open TikTok, if you just walk outside on your street, it's everywhere. Um, so there's an oversaturation. And for that, I think 
Um, like you were saying, Keith, I think those who were kind of using cannabis, they're like, ah, oh, it's just everywhere now. It's just capitalist cannabis. You know, the appeal kind of went away for some folks. And for some folks who um, were a bit scared by it or like who were unsure by it, even like older, like, um, like youth, I would say, um, there's been also an increase in interest is what I've also noticed. Like they're curious, they want to try it out. Like um, even if it's like, you know, for their first time. And I think um, I've seen like both, there's a decline and increase in different populations um, who've kind of had different perspectives on cannabis. And I think another important thing that I've noticed is um, this past three years, we were in, for two of those years, we were in a, in a pandemic. And I think in the beginning of that pandemic, um, we did a survey in cannabis and psychosis for youth, and we noticed there was an increase in cannabis use, especially during the pandemic. And 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 and, I, and you know, it was related to a lot of like you know mental, emotional, um, you know, coping coping strategies, you know, for physical um, health as well, you know. Um, they were using it because, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that were happening to many people in uh, across the country. And there was an increase in cannabis use as a coping me mechanism while it was still being legalized. So whether they were using it through dealers or whether they were getting access to the legal cannabis market, um, you know, daily kind of use we noticed was kind of increase. And, you know, it's interesting to see now that we're kind of coming out of a pandemic. What does that look like? Has there been an increase? increase still? Has it declined? I think that's still something that a lot of um, even universities, institutions and organizations are still, um, you know, um, looking forward to kind of understanding that and completing that um, survey and, and finding that information. So I think it's really important that, you know, with this legalization and boom of dispensaries and cannabis everywhere that, you know, um, the access is more, and and so there's a yes and no of appeal for different populations, which I find very interesting. Like you're saying, it's cool for some folks, and it's like uncool for, uh, for the other few, um, yeah. which which is funny. The, oh, I was, I was say, go go, go ahead. ahead go ahead. Okay. <laughs> oh, because I was just gonna say, but to add, like end like it's just making me think of like hearing you talk like on, to end on a more positive note. One of the good things to come out of it is the like the the more funding for education campaigns and stuff. Like this is cool. Um, the funding, how it's being gate kept, what's going on. It still has to all go through the government. That's a whole other thing versus like going directly into communities. But like. Um, that's a nice thing at least is like the more conversation that's been forced to have now, like universities have to reevaluate their cannabis policies. Schools have to reevaluate their drug education because even any amount of like, you know, ending prohibition and like reevaluating the war on drugs and like what it did is like still good in the end. We will, it's not, you know, it could be better, but it's still good. And then the needs of youth being like that mental health has just been at, at, exacerbated is yeah, that's a succinct thing. The pandemic and then just the state of things is like, mental health was already an issue and it's only it's not getting better yet but exactly and i think that's why it's so important for like harm reduction and for like mental health activists to talk about this because um as many of us know like the funding for mental health services is not at the level that we need it for. And especially during the pandemic, we saw that it, it hit very hard. And for a lot of folks, not just youth, but even like their families around them, you know, and that affects youth, you know, it's a ripple effect. And so, you know, seeing the increase of like, you know, coping strategies with like substance use, not just cannabis, but even maybe other substances, it, it shines the light that, you know, it's important that, you know, our government um, spends that money to invest in our mental health in youth mental health to ensure that, you know, that it's a very important part of our overall well-being you know you can't have health without mental health and that's something that was very was very much highlighted in this past couple of years especially with legalization all right all right so i think we can we have time for the next question the heat that you're talking about um so the next question that um i wanted to ask you all is have you faced any barriers um, in disseminating your content or creating your content? Um, and if so, what are these challenges? What do they look like? And um, how have you overcome them? Or are you still, you know, ha finding these challenges um, till this day? Uh, uh, Emma, did you, were you going to say something? <laughs> I can, I can say something um, quick. It's, uh, it, it's a very like. I won't like, be quick. So please do. Okay. Um, 
the one of the most frustrating challenges that is like like you can find work around sometimes um but it's just like like it's annoying on a core level is social media censorship of cannabis um we've tried to do tiktoks before there are a lot of tiktok users who get around it by using some abbreviation of like like way for weed instead um stuff like that we had a couple like facebook posts like censored because of using cannabis or because we had like positive cannabis messages in them before like that um so even like the platforms that we try to reach or do like like dissemination on um can sometimes like have just um restrictions against actually like putting any content about cannabis out there which is just kind of a frustrating um frustrating uh instrumental problem I, i'm not sure if that's the right word for it but you know it's terrible i hate it so much it's it's it, it, exactly what i was going to complain about it's basically just that like despite the fact that we're in a country where weed's legal we're still operating under like the global war on drugs where like generally despite being an exception weed is illegal and it's prohibited it's immoral weed users are criminals all of this stuff that i you know is what it is but um because like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, these like primarily are like American companies. Like we have to abide by like this like American imperialism drug policy leaking into social media community guidelines. I could go on about it, but it's just so ridiculous, especially when you're trying to do actual harm reduction and talk about cannabis, like drug use. It's like, we're trying to talk, tell people like, here's how you clean your bong. No, you can't show a bong. That's illegal activity. Like here's how to like, understand the packaging of your weed. No, you can't show weed. Like, how are we going to teach you? We can't show it. How are we going to, I don't know. So it's been like, at least like in terms of surpassing it, like having people like directly follow our social medias has been really helpful and share our content. And that's the only way it gets around anyway. Like one of our best TikToks was like showing how to make an apple pipe, which could be considered promoting use, but it's literally in contrast to smoking a can. Cause like in the video I say like, oh, some people smoke out of cans and bottles. This is a better alternative. Is it promoting weed use? Maybe. Is it funny? Yes. Were all the young weed smokers tagging their friends that smoke out of cans to tell them to stop and to consider smoking out of something else? Yeah. Until TikTok took it down. And then like we couldn't mobilize this like harm reduction message about like encouraging people to reflect on their smoking practices. Um, so yeah it's annoying it's 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 really not ideal but then i feel like at least like the cannabis like education community like all of the youth-led projects like are really well knit and we're always like promoting each other and like doing the cross promo and like working together and supporting each other which is like really nice in the face of this like barrier even though it's weed that it's still treated like it's such a big deal but um yes thank you for giving me the space to rant and do this emotional processing with you all about the frustrations of the cannabis censorship on like the weed censorship on social media um yeah thank you for sharing and yeah sylvia do you have you work in schools and you've done workshops in uh schools so have you um noticed like challenges what other um in that particular setting yeah, absolutely. So I train um, youth workers, law enforcement, educators to deliver the program. And these are a lot of people who grew up living through like the war on drugs where, you know, there was a lot of stigmatization and they are like just very recently learning the risks of that and the harm included. And, um, you know, having that type of rhetoric that um, isn't yeah, like being really like helpful to education and isn't pro-education. Um, I've had so many experiences, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, but definitely the one that stands out was uh, like just having educators speak over me in workshops. Um, our, the language I use when communicating with youth is if you choose to use. So it's not like, you know, if you, uh, yeah, it's if you choose to use. Um, you know, I've had a lot of educators who don't like that language and just say, but you wouldn't choose to use because you're all underage. It's like, okay, but they have been prior to legalization like that. We're past that. Um, so yeah, like having educators speak over you because, you know, especially at the time, like I was just younger. I think also the sexism within that as well. Um, some people just feel like entitled to speak over you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I think that has definitely been like one of the biggest challenges. Um, and yeah, I think I, I might, maybe I didn't mention this earlier, actually, but we work with law enforcement 
and having them um, switch into a polo when presenting. There's no need for weaponry in an education workshop, but obviously they, I think, you know, have, I'm not going to speak for them actually, but they, they have their reasons for why they like to be wearing the uniform when delivering the workshop. Um, and yeah, that's obviously like a, an issue in disseminating the content because youth aren't receiving the content if it's done in a way that possibly puts them in a position of fear or trauma. So um, yeah, those are, those are the challenges is having it be delivered without a harm reduction lens. Could I add something to that just quickly? Because we've done some engagement with schools too, because part of the Get Sensible's approach is like, it's like peer to peer, but it started out like a message from peer, from youth to parents and educators. So we do some engagement with schools as well. And like, we have like harm reduction principles and we have like guiding principles for education. And then sometimes like the school health policy is directly in conflict with our like principle. Cause like the principle is like non-punitive and they're like, that's nice in theory we got to report our students' drug use. And it's like that, you know, it, policy is often a barrier as well. Um, oh, yeah. Like, I'll say to students straight up at the beginning, like, if you tell me that you've used, like, I'm not here to, like, bring you to the police station. Like, I'm not affiliated with the law. Like, I, like, you can share use. And there'll be, like, teachers in the back, like, you know, judging me. And, like, yeah, I definitely find that a lot of times I'm much more um, on level with the students and helping them feel comfortable. And then like also trying to manage the fact that I'm also like a professional and like can't get fired and so have to manage the relationship with the educator as well. Yeah, um, sure and it's a fine those, balance. It's hard because they have those policies they have to abide by too, even though they don't want to a lot of the time, like the progressive teachers that are like, I'm for it, but they're like, but this is the policy. It's like, okay, that sucks. But yeah, like one time I had a teacher speak to me after and she was like, did this kid say that he was dealing drugs? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, what are you going to do about it? Like, I don't know. It's yeah. Yeah, I think that's a it's an issue, especially like we're talking about like even parents, too, or, you know, um, like, for example, like in cannabis and psychosis, like sometimes you need to have their consent of the parent if they're underage, right? Um, to like partake in um, materials talking about cannabis. And that could be a barrier, you know, if it be, especially if that stigma, it's still very much there and exists, especially amongst like the older adults. And, you know, um, you know, for so long, like the war on drugs and, and the history of it prior to legalization, it was demonized. And so there's still a lot of progress with the policies that are still in place that needs to kind of reflect the legalization and what we're doing. And now we're three years in and, you know, it's something that we're still working towards. And um, it's going to be tricky because policies are very much embedded in a lot of history. And um, yeah. Yeah. Matt has these really, this really cool program. I don't know if you guys have seen it um, called Smart Wheels and they have like this giant RV with um, VR headsets and oh. students who are in like grade five, like it's really young, which I find very impressive that like they're allowed to, you know, talk about drugs with such a young age group. Um, and they put on these VR headsets and they get to experience driving impaired, um, both by alcohol and by cannabis. So, you know, things are changing and they're moving in a good direction. And, you know, it's just about continuing the work to get it where, you know, is really hitting the mark as far as reducing harm and keeping the community safe. I will say in, in support of the, the things are changing, I've been very fortunate in that the educators or um, admin who I've worked with in the past, they've mostly been either teachers of um, like drug policy courses or um, like school nurses, et cetera. All of the educators who I've interacted with have been have been wonderful to work with. Um, I can't speak to the experiences of the rest of, of my team, but it's definitely been something hopeful that from what like I've seen in, in my experience, um, the educators are like willing to actually listen and like commit to a more harm reduction policy, which is definitely a, a more optimistic um, outlook, at least for the youth that they're teaching. It, it makes me happy whenever I, I do one of those workshops instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely education is the start for a lot of the change that hopefully will ripple into, um, you know, a, a better future for us all and a safer community for us all. And uh, I'd like to think, I think we're going to be um, wrapping up our panel and I'd like to thank all of our panelists that have come out today and for sharing your immense knowledge and for sharing your stories and, you know, for being honest and candid, you know, I think that really speaks to how um, we like 
to have our cannabis education, you know, being honest, including different perspectives. And um, for folks who are watching, um, for the individual um, organizations that are a part of here today, we'll link um, their information and their websites and their educational uh, materials in our bios and on our pages. So you can uh, go ahead and check them out. Um, they're creating a lot of great materials. And on our side here in Cannabis and Psychosis, um, we are going to be soon launching a mental health and cannabis course, a certificate course um, that we worked with um, uh, alongside many of our partners here. And so um, please feel free to check it out and check our links and our each respective organization. And um, for those folks who are still watching, um, there has a link for feedback survey. It would be greatly appreciated if you could complete that quick survey for us to let us know how we did. Um, thank you so much for listening, everyone, and for spending your great uh, Tuesday night with us all. Thank you. Thank you.